Proverbs chapter number 20, I'm going to begin reading verse number 10. The Bible says, Diverse weights and diverse measures, both of them are alike abomination to the Lord. Even a child is known by his doings, whether his work be pure or whether it be right. Now, verse number 10, I need to get you all back to where I'm at. All the goofy snow's melting and now the water is hitting the top of my head and I'm itchy. But anyway, need to get you all where I'm at. In Bible days, they didn't just go down to Kroger and buy a pound of sugar. But if there was sugar, okay, most of the time there wasn't, but if there was sugar, they'd have to go down to market and they'd have to tell whoever it is that they wanted to buy it from, hey, I'd like a pound. And then they'd have to weigh it out on the scales. Right, just like still sometimes a grocery store, you go in, you buy the fruit, you put it in the, well, I remember back when they still had the little basket right there that you'd weigh it right there next to the fruit. Nowadays they got the scales built into the self-scanners and everything. But you still buy what the weight of the products that you're buying. Well, that's what they used back in Bible days, except back in Bible days, it wasn't an electronic scale or it wasn't one that was hanging from the ceiling. They had springs on it. It was one that if any of you all have ever seen the scales of justice, okay, or Lady Liberty uh, on the coin, she's always holding a scale in her hand. They were very simple scales. There was a chain that went down to the middle, then it split into two, and then it went to each side of the scale, and it just had two plates. If everything was even, everything would be even. If one was heavier than the other, it would tilt. Very easy, very simple, very hard to mess that system up until you start trying to cheat people over. That's what verse number 10 is talking about. It says diverse weights. Well, how do you find out what a pound is of sugar? Well, you take something that weighs a pound and you put it on one side of the scale and it has to be known to weigh a pound. You're not guessing. It's a set weight. Like if, I don't know if y'all back in chemistry class or in physics class, there were very scientific weights that we would use where they very expensive because they were guaranteed that one gram weighed a gram and that 10 grams weighed 10 grams. Well, back in Bible days, there were very expensive weight sets that you could, and if you were a merchant or if you were somebody that traded their goods, you would have one of these sets. It was important that you had one of these sets because you needed to know what a pound was in case the other guy tried to pull the wool over your eyes. So you would put something that you knew weighed a pound on one side and then you would measure it out until everything evened out. That's how you knew that what was on the other side was a pound. Okay, well, it says diverse weights. Then it says in diverse measures. Well, sometimes you don't buy by the weight. You buy by the volume of something. Okay. Nowadays, people are too afraid to go ask their neighbor for something. But back in the day, hey, can I have a cup of sugar? Right? A cup is not a set weight. A cup is a volume. If you want to buy a cup of sugar, that may not weigh a pound, may not weigh a certain amount, but it is a size amount. And then they would put something that they knew was, we're going to fill this up right to the brim, and when it's full up to the brim, then we know that it's a cup. Or then we know it's a gallon. Or then, back in Bible days, they didn't use gallons or liters or anything. They would have used what was called a firkin. They'd go read the example, or the tale of Jesus at the marriage of Canaan said that they filled up the water pots that held two I think it was three to four firkins each okay that's what they used I don't know what the Roman standard would have been in Jesus's day don't know what the Hebrews used before that but I know that everybody had a set amount they had a cup they had a bleep they had a gallon had a teaspoon tablespoon whatever it was that they were that there was a measure because sometimes you did it by weight sometimes you did it by size Okay. Well, verse number 10 says, diverse weights meaning differing. That's what that word divers means. It means there's an array of them. Well, see, a pound is a pound is a pound. Diverse measures, a cup is a cup. The size of a cup 
is a cup. Anything less than that or more than that isn't a cup. If something weighs a pound, it's a pound. If it weighs more or less, it's not a pound. Well, if you've got a whole bunch of different people that say, no, this is what a pound is, but most of the time they're not going to argue on what a pound is. What they're going to argue is what a pound actually weighs. Because see, back in the day, you could have a vessel that on the outside was shaped just like everybody else's cup measure, but the walls of yours could just be a little bit thicker. So that when you measured out what you were going to sell to somebody, you were actually selling them less than a cup. But you were charging them for the price of a full cup. And it may not make you know, you the richest man in the world by doing that. But you'd have more at the end than what you should have. Which meant you robbed them. A diver's weight would be I'm telling somebody that this is what a pound weighs. But I go in and I drill out the center of that weight and put something heavier in. That means that it's going to say, well, that's what I'd do if I was trying to cheat. I'd make the pound heavier. Right? Because it doesn't make sense if I'm trying to sell somebody something, I make the pound. That means I have to give them more for the same price. No, that's what I would do or you would do if you wanted to cheat the guy. Well, here's what a pound weighs. Keep going, keep going, keep going, and really you get a pound and a half or whatever it is. If you were the guy trying to cheat the other person, you'd drill out the middle of the pound weight and then not fill it with anything so it's lighter. So you say, well, here's a pound, and you're giving somebody less than a pound. But there were people back then just as deceitful and just as, oh, what's the word, greedy as people are nowadays. Everybody's always been trying to find out a way to cheat people ever since sin came into the world. Right? Well, according to verse number 10, it says, Both of those, diverse weights and diverse measures, are alike abomination to the Lord. That wasn't that long ago that we taught on abomination. Abomination means it's something that God hates. Well, how much does God hate diverse weights and diverse measures? Well, if we were to use really what's it talk, it's talking about cheating somebody lying to somebody you're saying that a pound is a pound when you know that it's not a pound you're saying that this cup is you know measured out to be exactly one cup but you know that it didn't and it's either for your gain or for their loss or both well God kind of thought a whole lot about that because when he started giving the law to Israel is in the first ten thou shalt not bear false witness Truly, what is a diverse weight or a diverse measure? It means that you're lying to somebody else, and a lot of times you're lying to yourself. But, well, it's okay if I do that. It's just a little bit. It's just this, it's just that. But no, God said that you ought to do right by people. And by knowing, they said, well, they should know better. If they don't have their own set of weights, then they're just begging to be robbed. No. You're begging for an excuse to get away with something that you know is wrong. It says it's an abomination to God. It means God hates it. We ought to hate it. I don't go to Kroger and see, it's very rare that I'm buying something by weight, but I don't see the Kroger employees say, well, hey, let me weigh that for you. And then they put their finger on the scale and push it down to make it weigh more than what the thing actually weighs. Right? That's a good way to get smacked, especially by an old lady that knows how, exactly how much that thing weighs. Right? She had three scales in her pocket, and she pulled them out to make sure she knew what it was before she went up to the counter. Right? But you don't see that. Well, it's because nowadays the way of weights and measures has gone the way of the dodo right, nowadays you just trust that whoever packaged whatever it was put the right amount in there right, now are they right all the time probably not but they're probably closer to right than they are to wrong all the time but it's not on you anymore to ensure that what you're buying is what it is or what it says that it is or what you're expecting 
If you don't like it, don't buy it. There's about 12 other options down the rest of the aisle. Well, back in Bible days, I had to keep other people honest. Okay, well. It also goes on to say, verse number 11, even a child is known by his doings, whether his work be pure or whether it be right. But now, not being judgmental, I'm just recalling memories, okay? Experiences. There are some kids that when they came into church, I'm thinking, that kid fooled the devil. Right there are other kids that, hey, that's the sweetest kid I've ever seen. Right? Even a child, a youngin, you know whether or not they got pureness or they got evil in their heart. Right? Christian had a whole bunch of evil in them. His nickname was Mad Dog, not as like a cute little nickname. No, it's because he used to bite people. Right? And not just like, I play, no. Like he'd leave indents in your arm and it'd bruise. Like he was evil. Okay? What happened? Dad beat the evil out of him. Okay? And then everything worked out. Okay? Then there are other kids that if another kid falls down, they're the first one over there. Oh, are you okay? Right? You can just tell that they have a kind heart. Other kids are all about breaking stuff, Christian. Right? And other kids are about keeping all the toys, Sydney. Okay, and I'm over there watching both of them fight, thinking, they told me to watch them, but how in the world am I supposed to do anything with this? Most of the time I was watching TV. That was most, they told me to watch them, I'd just watch TV instead. I was watching something. But you didn't almost, it was Sydney that almost drowned. You were having fun in the fountain. That was my fault. <laughs> Luckily, Sydney was just tall enough that her nose was just above the water, even when the bathtub was full. But anyway, that's a, ask mom about that story. That's a, that was a day that Jordan almost got beat to death. Anyway. But some kids, you know, if you leave them alone, something bad's going to happen. Right? Just another, like an RC car is going to end up wound up in the sister's hair. Right. Did he start the day thinking that? No, but he thought, hmm, wonder what it would be like if I did this and put it in her hair and went, hmm? Right? I wonder what will happen if I throw this rock up onto the church roof. <laughs> yeah, that was a bad one. <laughs> yeah. But, but so it's saying, even a young child, somebody that can't talk, Somebody that can barely walk sometimes. Some of them know as soon as they start crawling, they're in trouble. But they aren't articulate. They haven't been educated. They haven't figured out what they're going to do for the rest of their life. But you can still look and watch what they do and see the good and the evil of what they're doing. You can tell what's on the inside based off of the deeds that they do. Well, if it's that easy to determine for a youngin, why do we try and complicate it when people get older? Things are either right or wrong. Right? There's no difference. Beauty of the Bible is that there's this, in the uh, debating world, we use the term bright line. That means that there's a clear line drawn between the two sides. And it's clear to see what's right and what's wrong. But the Bible, there is only bright line. God doesn't mix sin and holiness, God doesn't mix righteousness and unrighteousness. In fact, he very clearly divides between what's right and what's wrong. Okay, the law was given so that you would know what's right and wrong to figure out that you do a whole lot of wrong, and that's why you needed a Savior. Right, the New Testament tells us what God expects, which is the image of His Son, Christ, and holiness, and then a lot of instruction on how we can do it. Well, if you get in and you realize, well, I don't look like Jesus, that means that you've got work to do. You're either like Christ or you're not like Christ. There's no in-between. Jesus himself said, A man cannot serve two masters, or love one and hate the other. You can't be like God and then not like God at the same time. It's one or the other. You can't be serving God while at the same time serving self. It's one or the other. You can't chase after the treasures of heaven and the treasures of the world at the same time. Where a man's heart is, there his treasure will be also, the Bible tells us. It's not as easy as, well, let's 
you know, I, I did my best. Well, your best isn't good enough. That's why Jesus said that the arm of flesh will fail you. But I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. It's not dependent on what you can do. It's what dependent on what God can do through you. He did not tell you to be, you know, the, uh, the bulldozer. Okay, fire it up and you're just going to move everything in life out of your way. No, he instructed us to be vessels of honor. The Old Testament talks about us being, you know, the psalmist wrote that we were arrows in the hand of God. Other times there are examples on how we are the instruments of God, the tools of God. You're never the hand that's doing the swinging. You're never the one that's doing the pouring. You're just the instrument that God is using to impact somebody else. You know what your job is as a Christian? It's to be the best vessel that you can be for God. You know what the purpose of a vessel is? To be filled up and then emptied over and over. Why do we come to the house of God to get filled up? But when you come, don't know. We're going to say it. God told me to say it. The purpose of church is not to come out so that you can get all the Bible and all the study in and everything that you need for the rest of the week. The purpose of church is to come out and to worship. The purpose of the house of God is to come in and get your battery recharged. Right? The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. Well, when we come in here, we get our spirit charged up so that the spirit's so willing that the flesh can't help but to do what the spirit wants to do. Right? I mean, we show me in the Bible in the New Testament where you brought lost people to church and they got saved at church. Not going to happen. You find that after they got saved, they brought him to church. Then they got, well, they got saved, then they got baptized, then they brought him to church. Because they wasn't a member of the church until they got baptized. Now I understand nowadays, but certainly sinners are welcome. Certainly. If somebody wants to know about the Lord, they, there's a good place to show up, it's the house of God. But in Bible days, they'd go out and they'd witness and they'd win them to the Lord outside of church. Then after they got saved and baptized, then they'd bring them to church to disciple them so that they could teach them what was taught unto them. Why? So that when they went out into the world, they had everything that they needed to win somebody to the Lord. That's how Jesus started the church. But nowadays, if you're not in church, you can't get saved. Hogwash. I got saved in a garage. Just as real as anything that anybody else got. Right? But Ray got saved behind the wheel of a Chevy. Right? God had to be in it or he direct. Yeah. He was having himself a case that can't help it. I don't know how he got to church the rest of the way. God. But we limit God to where we decide, well, the scale says that, you know, the pastor knows the most about it. Sure, surely. If the Bible says that they can't hear without a preacher, we need to get them to the preacher. Well, that word preacher just means somebody that goes and tells the good news of God. You too can be a preacher. You may not stand up behind a pulpit and never preach a sermon, but you can go out into the world and preach that, hey, Jesus came and died because you needed a Savior. How shall they hear unless somebody goes, how many people never would walk or darken the doors of a church? I don't know how we got off on all this, but we're going to do it. Right? The scales, the measures, the weights that people use every day to determine what, what does God want me to do? What does God not want me to do? What are my responsibilities as a Christian? What are things that I shouldn't worry about and should entrust to the Lord? Right? Those ways, each and every one of us got a set of those weights. The question is, is whether or not our weights match the weights that God has. Because we know His are right. We know that God, in the Word of God, says what's right, what's wrong. This is what you should do. This is what you shouldn't do. This is what you're responsible for. This is what you're supposed to cast upon the Lord. Because He said, cast all your cares upon Him, for He cares for you. We know that the Bible's right. But the question is, is are our scales matched up with his? For instance, you know whose responsibility it is to win the world? Yours. 
just as much as it is mine just as much as it is the pastors and the churches but it's the great commission was given just as much to you as it was to the apostle Paul and to Peter and to John and to all the other apostles right God expected as much effort from you to win the world as it did or as he did from the early church but yet somewhere along the line the weight got shaved down to, well as long as I give to missions I'm involved in winning the world well that may be Samaria and the other most parts of the world but what about Jerusalem you expect the pastor to win all the lost people in Florence or in northern Kentucky or in Ohio or Indiana that's not what God expects God expected you to be a light under the world but yet we think that if we give to missions or as long as we give our tithe or as long as we support the pastor that that's enough to go out and to stand before God and say Lord I did what you told me to do that's not what God told you to do God told you to go ye that's a specific ye means you nowadays not a general you that would have been y'all he meant you individual of course he's talking to all of us but he's talking to you specifically go ye unto all the world well I can't get there preacher that's why God gave us missionaries go study the epistles you're going to find that the apostle Paul said that the church at Philippi and at Thessalonica and all these other churches that they often gave to his need where was their church at in Philippi or in Thessalonica what were they concerned with well they couldn't go where the apostle Paul was they went to where they could go and they became involved they attached themselves to the apostle Paul and gave unto his need time and time again because they wanted to be a part of what he was doing they weren't doing it because he was the preacher that saved them no they wanted to become invested in the work of God well there's a weight and there's a measure that says what you're responsible for there's a weight and there's a measure on what your duties are as a, Christ, uh, as a Christian. And if yours don't match up with what God says, then your weights are wrong. According to God, it's an abomination. Because you claim to be something without knowing what it is to be that thing. Let us examine it, look at another one. We've already talked about witness outlines out the window so we just, we, we're going not in order no more we just, we're just going to circle back around or circle in the wagons but see that's your witness that's what you're supposed to go out into the world but what about your standards and I believe it's in the book of Deuteronomy and I know it's in Proverbs but God says to touch not in Proverbs he says ancient landmarks and Deuteronomy said the landmarks of your fathers those things that were set up back in the day landmarks weren't the Statue of Liberty or the you know the St. Louis Arch right or the Mall of America they weren't things that were big and grand and you could see from a long way away they were just a stack of stones they were big enough so that they could be seen but they weren't necessarily you know big tall pillars and pyres to the sky where everybody for miles around could see it it was something that if you was walking upon it you'd see it now sometimes those landmarks were boundaries they'd put a landmark there that says hey this is the end of my property and the start of somebody else's property they'd put a landmark that says hey this is the end of Israel and the beginning of another country they'd put a line that says hey you know they, these may be more temporary but this year we're growing in this field and we're going to give this field rest because they're cycling crops right? there was a line that was drawn between those two nowadays they still do it they go out and they except now they're little tiny wooden sticks right? and they got a ribbon on the top of them and they mark out property lines when they're doing construction or when uh, property's being evaluated to be sold they'll go back and they'll reevaluate it they'll draw the landmarks again right those landmarks were permanent Israel was always Israel 
right? My property was always my property and yours was always yours unless a deal was made. But see, twice God said, don't touch them landmarks. Unless there's a reason to move them, which means something's changed. But even then, let's say I buy your property, but then I want to sell it again. If I move the landmarks, I don't know what I owned originally and what I'm trying to sell to you now. The markers would stay there. The owner of the landmark may have changed, but the landmark's still the same landmark. It was put there to be permanent, and don't touch them. Don't move them. Don't try and tear them down and build them back up in the exact same, you know, configure. It's not going to be the same because it's not where it was supposed to be. But some people's scales are a little off when it comes to those landmarks. You know what God said? That you should always be, you know, when it comes to garments and apparel, that you should look respectable. You should look decent. Okay. We just down there. I almost got into an argument. I was good, Sister Kathy, but I almost got into an argument. Somebody asked, but you know, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? So I told him. And it's not what I think. It's what the Bible says. But a lot of people, okay, we're going to call them legalists or Pharisees, will tell you that in order to be right with God, a woman shouldn't wear that which pertains to a man. Okay. Well, here's the thing. When that was written, that was given to Moses. Anybody know what Moses wore at that time? He wore a tunic. You know what that is? It's a skirt. So does that mean that none of the women in Israel were allowed to wear skirts? That's the only question that I asked, and that made that guy very confused. Because he'd never heard of that before. Why? Because he doesn't study the Bible. He'd somebody preach to him that women shouldn't wear pants. Show me chapter and verse on that. You know why God gave them that commandment? Because there's this thing that used to, back in the day, they would, you know, these they're getting ready to cross over into a strange and foreign land. In that place that they're getting ready to cross into, it was very common that they would have feasts where women would dress up like men. You know what doesn't pertain to a woman? A beard. Okay? You know what doesn't pertain to a woman? Okay, back then, men would wear what nowadays we'd call turbans. Right? Women most of the time would wear a veil to keep the sun off of their face. Men would wear turbans. They're saying there's certain things that men wear, there's certain things that women don't wear. Right? It wasn't right for a woman to gird up herself with a sword. That was a man's job. Right? Women weren't you know, often seen with weapons. Okay? That was the man's responsibility. There were things that pertained to a man, meaning it was the man's responsibility. Or that's what a man would wear customarily. But when they crossed over, when it says that they were supposed to wear what they were supposed to wear, these other places, women dressed like men and men would dress like women and they'd use it as an affair to seduce someone of the same sex into homosexuality. That's why God said, hey, wear what you're supposed to wear. God's not the author of confusion. God, now we own the trans people. God expected that you dress like what you were. That's what woman shouldn't wear that which pertains to a man. And the same was vice versa. Men shouldn't wear that which pertains to a woman. Right? But now the scale has been shifted to where, well, men wear pants, women can't wear pants. Well, if that were true, okay, women in Scotland wore skirts, men couldn't wear kilts. But the standard isn't uniform all the way across the board. Guys wear sunglasses. Does that mean women not allowed to wear sunglasses? Well, well, neither one of those pertains to the other. Neither do pants. Pants are just a garment. Okay, now what do I believe you should wear when you come to church? Your best. What do I believe you should wear when you're out and about? I believe that the Bible says that you should be dressed decently and that you shouldn't bring dishonor to yourself. That's what, that's what the Bible teaches. 
you can think different, but you're wrong. But nowadays, y'all, you can't be right with God if you're a woman, if you're a woman. If the best that you've got is a pair of blue jeans, wear the pair of blue jeans to church. If you've got a skirt, but it's all tattered and it smells bad, and you don't want to disgrace the house of God with it, wear your best. I don't care. You know what I care about? What your desire is when you walk in the door. But there's people out there that teach a whole bunch of weird stuff. Now, if that's what God convicted you with, okay, if you, hey, I believe that when I should go to church that I should wear a skirt. That's what you believe as a woman. If you're a dude, that God's not going to convict you of that. If you think he did, we need to have a talk with the pastor. But if that's what, I believe that I should be dressed modestly. And I believe that this is what God would have me to dress. That's fine for you to believe if that's what God gave you a chapter and verse on. But you can't get up and start teaching it to somebody else's Bible. That's not a landmark. That's not something that God set up and said, hey, do this or don't do that. That's called a preference between you and God. You're free to have your own preferences. You're a human being. But don't tell me that if I don't keep your preferences that I'm not right with God. The landmarks have been shifting. Right? People got scales in things that used to were unholy. Nowadays they're acceptable. Not in the eyes of God. See, standards, the reason that they're called standards is because used to, when people would go into battle, they'd have this thing called a battle standard. Okay, nowadays we call them flags. And they would take the flag with, so that everybody knew who they stood with. Right? There'd be a standard for the nation, there'd be a standard for the, you know, the legion or the regiment or for the individual group. There'd be all these standards saying, this is who we are and you know what we stand with. Well, you know what Bible standards are? It's just you sticking up a flag in the front yard saying, this is what I believe. Your standards should be the standards of God. Standards are to identify you as a Christian. Well, how can it be a standard that's supposed to separate you unto God if you look like the world, act like the world, talk like the world, dress like the world? Well, the world wears skirts. Yeah, but I've seen some of the skirts that the world wears and God not, a, God not okay with that. That's not modest. Modest is a standard. But I don't come in with cut-off suit pants Right in sleeveless jackets. That's not modest. Right, modesty is a standard, but the standard of holy and unholy. There's there's people that teach that if you don't wear a white shirt when you're up preaching behind the pulpit, you're not right with God. Show me chapter and verse on that. The Bible also says that rabbis weren't supposed to cut their, you know, certain parts of their hairs. I don't see these guys with big curly long sideburns, so what, why is it right for some and not right for others? But the hypocrisy of changing the weights or changing the scales, changing the measurements that we use on what's right and what's wrong, it's an abomination unto God. I know what we hear around here and what gets preached around here. But see, you go and you listen to a book or you listen to somebody on the internet or you listen to the radio and all of a sudden well you know what that sounds like a good idea well first off an idea isn't a conviction you ought to pray about anything you ought to let God burn it into your heart that's when it's really a conviction but just because it's a good idea doesn't mean that God's for it or against it there's blessing and cursing and everything the problem is, is when you say, well, this is the scale that everybody else should use. No, I'm going to use the scale that God said to use. And if God says it's okay, then I'll pray about it. If God says it's wrong, it ain't going to happen. And if God said that it's not just okay, but it's mandatory, doesn't matter whether I like it or you like it or not. That's what we got to do. There are things that God said you got to do. There are things that God said it's up to you. Right? Right? one way or the other as long as it doesn't hinder you in what you're expected to do as a Christian 
If it is something that hinders you, don't do it. But if it doesn't bother you, right, if it isn't a stumbling block, go ahead. And then there's things that he said, nope. And guess what nope means? It means nope yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Nope means never. Never going to be right with God. Well, there's a lot of people, well, it's okay to do this if. That might be true. But if it's one of them standards, it's set in stone. You can cover it up. You can try and put trees and leaves and branches on top of it. It's still there. That landmark still right where God put it. You can either walk on this line of it and be right with God, or walk on this line of it and be wrong with God. In God's eyes, there's no in-between. Unless you are wholly across the line. If you're reaching back and trying to grab onto something, you cross the line. Well, my foot didn't cross it. You reached across the line. God said, don't cross that line. Don't cross the line. God didn't say, toe the line. God didn't say, get as close as you can without falling over. God said, anything on that side of that line is wrong. You know what I'd do? I'd stay away from the line. If I have to, I'll go up to the line, but I ain't crossing the line. So many people trying to shave off as much of their weight as they can and still be right with God. God's weight didn't change. God's weight still says that when you come into the house of God, you ought to wear your best. You ought to give your best. It ought to be expected of you to give back unreservedly unto God because that's what worship is. But God's expectations are also that long before you get here, you've been studying, you've been praying, you've already been unified with the Holy Spirit deep down in here to where the pastor don't have to preach on how you should live because the Holy Ghost has already told you all week. The pastor gets to come in and encourage and edify and try and strengthen those that have been out in the world, they've been poured out and they're weary to try and encourage them to keep going on. We had so many preachers all across this country. Every Sunday they got to get up and say, this is how the Bible says you ought to live. Show me a chapter and verse where the, it's the preacher's job to tell you how to live. No, it's the preacher's job to give himself to study and to prayer so that when you come in, if you have a question, he can do it. But it's his job to lead the flock. He's the under-shepherd. He's supposed to watch it. It's his, the Bible says that you ought to respect him because he watches for your souls. Right? He's there to say, hey, this is dangerous. Okay? The Bible talks about this, and that falls in line with this. It's a new thing according to the world, but it's still old. Or, hey, let's have a revival meeting so that we can get our spirits stirred up again. So that we can be on fire to go out and do what's Thus saith the Lord. You know whose job it is to tell you what's right and what's wrong? The Holy Ghost. The pastor doesn't make you into the image of Christ. You know what does? The Holy Ghost. You know what the pastor's job is? Is to be here. Just like Moses was in the wilderness. Don't go that way. Then people, they don't believe the right way. Then people are going to be trouble. Hey, this new thing came up and it ain't right. Just because the world says it's right doesn't mean that it's right. It's your job to figure out what God wants you to be and then to allow God to let you be it, to make you into what you're supposed to be. You're supposed to be willing to step back onto the potter's wheel and say, Lord, make me into what you want make me into. You're supposed to beg God to put you back into the fiery furnace so that you can become hardened, right, permanent, that it sets and it's a part of you. Why? Because if you've got a clay bottle and you fill it up with water, clay is going to, you know, form. You go pick it up, it's going to smush, water's going to come out. It's not permanent. It looks like it does, but unless it's fired, it's not going to stick. You're supposed to beg, Lord, make me into the image of your son. But see, that, that, that weight where it says... The image of Christ, a lot of people lost that. It's not even that they've changed it. They just said, well, we don't need to do that anymore. We just got to be Christian. Well, that does mean Christ-like, dum-dums. But you know, the only thing that God has ever, only thing God has ever found acceptable is His Son. 
You know what we're going to look like when we get to heaven? His son. You know what he expects us to look like down here? His son. Why do you think he robed us in his righteousness? So when the father sees us, he sees his son. You know what? God expects you to have the heart that Christ had in him. The mind that Christ had in him. But all those weights, people aren't interested in those weights. They want to talk about how they dress better than the other person so they're more holy. Or how I don't need to go and tell that person because that person, you know, offended me. I don't need to do this, that, or the other because that person doesn't do it or because I do this more than the other person. Hogwash. You know what God's standard is? Holy, unholy. He said, be ye holy, for I am holy. That means unless you're holy, you're not what God wants you to be. That's a real simple math problem. God expects holy. Anything less than holy is not holy. And the thing about holiness, you can't add to it either. You don't have to do what God wants you and do this on top. Holy is holy. Holy means complete, perfect, nothing lacking. Well, if you're not lacking anything, why would you add to it? If the recipe's perfect, why would you start messing with it? Why would you start throwing something else in there? It's going to change it. It's not going to be the perfect recipe anymore. There's a lot of things that people think they're okay with. Right, but it's real easy to find out even a child is known by his doings you want to find out if you're really in line with God go ask Lord show me the things that I've been doing and whether or not they're right because what's in your heart works its way out out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh we know that where your heart is your treasure is going to be also well how did you get them treasures you labored for them you worked so ask God to take an inventory. Lord, those things that are most important to me, do they speak of that I've been laboring for you or that I've been laboring for myself or for the world or for somebody else? That's why people don't... You can't have the Bible and teach the things that they teach nowadays. That's why they keep trying to change it. Because God prophesied, and it's true that when a man looketh into the Word of God, he beholds himself as in a glass. It's a mere, it shows you what truly is there. That's why they've got to change it so that when you get in here, you don't see yourself, you see something different. Because if you really saw yourself, you'd say, I need more of him in my life. Everyone, this side of heaven, when you get in here, you see, I can be more Christ-like. Everybody, when you get in here, there's more, well, Lord, keep working on me. Let's get this imperfection out. Lord, let's continue to develop me because I want to be more fit for the Master's use. God can use whatever He wants to. You don't have to get to the point where you're perfect in order for God to use you. God uses those that are available. Go study the Bible. David was an adulterer. Moses was a murderer. Samson was a whoremonger. There's a whole bunch of people that outwardly they weren't perfect yet but they were available and God used them God uses the base things that can found them. if somebody was perfect then of course God would use them but God uses those that the world says aren't perfect to do great things for him because man look at on the outward we're more focused on perfecting that inner man we're more focused upon what we ought to be spiritually because if the inward man gets right with God the outward man is going to be compelled to do that which the Spirit says we ought to do. Well, verse number 11. Whether his work be pure and whether it be right. Pure means that all additives have been removed from it. All contaminants have been removed from it. You know what pure water is? Water. It's not salt mixed into it. It's not chlorine or fluoride or anything else. Water is water. Pure water is water and nothing else. 
the true scale when we put it on a scale we should look at the purity of God and what he intends for our actions to be and then really look at what we've been doing you know why we ought to go out and win the world because we have a perfect love for God and we have a perfect love for the souls of those that are lost if you look at why you go out and you witness or why you go out and go on visitation and there's anything added to a love for God and a love for lost souls then it's not pure there's something else there. it's tainted it's contaminated well why did I come to church today unless it's to worship God and to hear from heaven it's contaminated right? when I went out on the job today did I do what God commanded me which is to do all things as unto the Lord did I work my job like Jesus asked me to do everything I was supposed to do on the job today if not then it wasn't pure Purity is real easy to detect. Because it either is or it isn't. Again, that's the way God does it. Is or is not. There's no gray, there's no in between. There's no make you know what Christianity plus the world is? Worldliness. You know what holiness and unholiness mixed together? Unholiness. Because those things of God, they're pure, they're unadulterated, they're unmitigated. It means that they are what God said they were. And then as a result of that, the world can see, taste and see that the Lord is good because it doesn't have any us in it. It doesn't have any of the world in it. It has God, and God is altogether lovely. But it all starts with getting the right scale, the right weights again. Because if we keep using ours, we're going to th keep thinking we're okay, like the church at Laodicea. They were increased with good and thought that they had need of nothing when really they were poor and needy and blind and naked. Their scales were wrong. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.